Hello, everyone from the Heights Adult Services, Heights Library Adult Services. I'm Professor Sherry Burr. I am the author of several dozen books, and my 27th book was Complicated Lives, uh, Free Blacks in Virginia, 1619 to 1865. And I'm particularly proud of this book because not only did it take six years to research and write and publish it, but also it was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize in History, which was my first nomination. Um, what else would you like to know, John? Well, I think that uh, covers it. And uh, you've done most of your academic work in New Mexico, is that the- Yes, uh, at the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque, which of course became quite famous for Breaking Bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's so funny. I travel the world before COVID, and that would be one of the things people would mention when I'd say Albuquerque, it would be Breaking Bad. So it put us in a, on the map, but not in the best possible way. Well, yes, we used to get here in Cleveland, Drew Carey show. Oh, if you remember that, yes. Yes. Well, and he's still on The Price is Right, and he's not a, and he had another comedy show. He's not a, a bad guy. So that's a good guy to be associated yeah. with. That's true. So um, can you uh, begin by kind of speaking about the journey to the book and how you came to write it and what you discovered? Sure. So this happened serendipitously, actually. Um, I had broken an ankle and I was home for several months uh, as it was healing. And I was going through a bag of letters uh, and I found one from my great aunt mentioning that she was on her way to Wyoming several decades before to visit a, uh, her aunt Lillian. And I wondered what was a black woman doing living in Wyoming in the 1950s, which is curious because uh, I live in New Mexico and people often ask me that question. Uh, so I had to do some research for an intellectual property book and I was gonna go to um, North Dakota and to Montana uh, because they had museums with relevant information. And so I decided, well, why not fly into one and out the other? Cause that's such a big swath of country. And um, I could just drive through Wyoming um, from one to the other. And I stopped by the clerk's office. I found out where Aunt Lillian had lived. And the, um, the person in charge of the assessor's office, you know, got the address for me linked to the deed. And she said, oh, that's Miss Lucy Vigo. She still lives there. Wow. So I went, she told me how to get there. I went and knocked on the door. I said, I'm Sherry Burr. I'm the, the great, great niece of Lillian Faye Todd. And she said, come on in. <laughs> and it turned out that Miss Lucy Vigo was from Wagon Mound, New Mexico, of all places. Uh, and um, she had not only bought Aunt Lillian's house, she had bought all of her furniture. So I um, was walking into a family history museum inadvertently. And so, and she was just the nicest, sweetest person. So then um, uh, it turned out Aunt Lillian's grave site, she told me how to find Aunt Lillian's grave. It didn't have a headstone. So I decided to arrange to put a headstone on the grave. And that brought out even more of Aunt Lillian's friends. And I was curious because by then she had been dead like 38 years that she had so many people who remembered her so fondly and serendipitously I had to give a talk in Salt Lake City and um, someone said oh check out the family history library and I thought oh 15 minutes and three and a half hours <laughs> later or so I'd closed it down and I'd walked out with this stack of paperwork where I chased traced Aunt Lillian back through um her father, who was my great great grandfather, um, to a, a schedule in Virginia in 1850. And it said free inhabitants of Virginia. And I found my great great grandfather listed as a three year old. He had been born in 1847. And he was living on the farm of his grandfather. And so then I, I had not even known before, I wasn't taught this in school that there were free blacks uh, before slavery. So then I got really curious and that led to a trip to the Library of Virginia where a librarian um, helped me find the emancipation deed 
for my fourth great grandfather who had been emancipated from slavery in 1787 as a two year old along with his parents. So then I was just totally hooked, which is how one gets into these projects. And I wanted to know more about these people who had been free before the Civil War, because I was under the misperception, as many people are, that all Blacks were, were slaves before the Civil War and all whites were slaveholders. And none of that turned out to be true. Um, not only were there free Blacks, they had farms and businesses. Um, while my uh, fourth grade grandfather had been liberated uh, by a plantation owner after the, the Revolutionary War who felt it was inappropriate to own people when he and others had just fought for his freedom. Uh, um, many Blacks were emancipated during this time, this 20 year period after the Revolutionary War, and also Blacks purchased themselves out of slavery. You know, um, slaves uh, were mandated to have one day a week off and usually it was Sunday and they could work on their own, save their money, and many purchased their way out of slavery, bought land, and had property. So that's where it just became this rolling kind of, I kept discovering more things, and I just kept just digging deeper because it was just so fascinating to me, this tale that had rarely been told. Yeah, and I, I, I mean, that's an amazing uh, story, you know, it, um... It's interesting too that you came across the the free black because there's the um, you know that status because when um, I tell this story often that one of the members of our group when she was doing the genealogy of her family she had to take a moment where she about a week off because she found like where they had been purchased and and it was just so moving because it was the first time she had seen her you know, great, great grandfather's name in print. And it was in this purchase document. And it was just so like it put in a whole- Yeah, I understand that because um, I was trying to figure out more about my fourth great grandfather's mother um, and where she had come from. So I ended up spending several hours uh, at the Library of Virginia going through all the deed books, looking for slave names with that first name. And by the end, I was in tears because I found where slaves with that name had been sold, where their children had been divided, where there were will books where it said that one, one kid, one son would get half of this, uh, this slave's increase. And to see children referred to as increase was, was horrible to watch. Um, and in the end, I, I ended up deciding that she was relatively new to the country um, because I didn't, I didn't find her anywhere in these deed books. So I felt like she was a relatively new kidnap victim um, because the person who had owned her before he died and left the property to his son had been a slave trader. So that had been my, my uh, ultimate conclusion. And then of course you start, you, you wanna go through all the slave records um, and the UNESCO has this huge website of slaves coming in, but of course they're not gonna tell real names, you know, because they're, they've, they've engaged in a crime, right? They've kidnapped people out of Africa to bring them here and so that's a challenge and I feel like um, the more sophisticated DNA becomes that ultimately what I hope will be able to happen is that black people will be able to trace their ancestry to specific villages in current African countries go there find the oral historian and find the oral history story of what happened to our relatives so that's my ultimate uh, wish list about this kind of research. Yes, and, and hopefully that, that's coming in the future. <laughs> yes. The, um, the, one of the things that I think uh, we can kind of tie this together is it was interesting to me in, in your book how you, you know, um, kind of set up the, the competing uh, narratives of kind of like this free Black community versus how the colonies were slowly and systematically changing the status of black people in America legalistically. 
Right. And that was something I thought was important to highlight because um, one of the things that surprised me as I was going through the research is I never found one de definitive law that said all black people are slaves. They never did that. And instead, what it was, was this kind of slowly evolving legal system where in the 1660s, they started saying things that heritage will be matrilineal, free blacks will give birth to free, free women, give birth to free women, enslaved women give birth to enslaved women. So that was one of the first hints that they had this status of, of enslaved women. Um, and also at the same time, it's showing that they have a status of free women. And there's a law in 1668 that talks about the rights of free Negro women. So that's an acknowledgement that there's a community of free Negro women who have their rights. Um, and so it was interesting to be able to bring that out, that there were free blacks in Virginia from the beginning. And in some ways, the more I did this research, the more I thought that that made it worse, that they, that the slavery involved, evolved because they had all these people who were free within their midst, managing their own property, managing their own lives. And so all the stereotypes that developed over later on, like black people were too feeble-minded to, to take care of themselves, it was all bull. And it was all refuted by the presence of free blacks that were in Virginia from the beginning. And that, that's, that's great. And I'm, um, I heard this quote from Dick Gregory, who kind of lost his mind towards the end of life, but he said that, <laughs> he said that, you know, he grew up in a neighborhood that white people never saw. He saw the black doctors, he saw the black dentist, he, you know, he grew up in a middle class black community that kind of lived within this pocket of invisibility. And it almost seems to me like the, the free black community in American history has always been that way. So that, that's, I, I mean, do you feel the same way? What happened to them, do you think, post? Um, you know? Well, it was, a, it, it's, a, it's a strange world. Pre-Civil War South is a strange world because for one thing, it's an integrated world. What we associate with segregation is the Jim Crow world that came after Reconstruction. That's when you started having these laws, you know, Black people can't drink from the same water fountain and all that kind of hot, horrible stuff. Um, Pre-Civil War South was not like that. It was very integrated. Um, and so you had Blacks and whites living next door to each other. Um, and uh, and there were legal cases where um, when they took away the rights of free blacks to um, and enslaved blacks to give testimony in court, what would happen is white people would give testimony on behalf of free blacks. So there was one instance where a white woman decided she wanted this free black person's territory property so she just went in there and occupied it and several white males in the village went to court to testify on his behalf that he had the right to that property uh he won the case and she had to pay damages so it was a it's kind of it's 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 not something that we normally, it's not a world that we normally think of. And it's a world that's very shocking for all the stereotypes that we've been taught in our lifetime. When I think that that, uh, that kind of leads me to the, the, one of the most fascinating parts of the, your book is the kind of the, the second half when you start going through the founding fathers. And not only how many of them were slave owners, which is, you know, we kind of know, but how many of them had relationships with, um, you know, kidnapped black people. And that is just, that's an amazing uh, story. So maybe if you could kind of talk about how like, how that, it, it led sure. to, yeah. Yeah, see, so there's a chapter that's called the anti-slave holding, uh, anti-slavery slave holding paradox because all these slaveholders among the founding fathers, Washington, Jefferson, Hamilton, Burr, um, Benjamin Franklin, John Jay, Madison and Monroe, uh, they all would pontificate against slavery. 
not a single one ever said slavery is absolutely right. We have an absolute right to this. Never did any of them say that. Instead, they all talked about what an evil practice it was. It's like one of the worst things in the world. Over and over again, you have this language where they're saying how terrible slavery is, and yet they own slaves. And so it's 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 it was fascinating to me. Are they just outright hypocrites? You know, what's going on? So that was that was interesting. And then of course you have Jefferson and Burr who had relationships with women of color. Um, Jefferson is well known for his relationship with Sally Hemings, which his family tried to hide by they destroyed all the letters that mentioned her. But what they didn't do is they didn't destroy the farm book where Jefferson kept detailed records of everything he purchased. So in Paris, he was spending, he spent $200 on a dress for Sally in Paris in 1780s. If a guy spent $200 on a dress for me now, I think he was interested, right? That's the equivalent of thousands of dollars he was spending on her clothing. As sl regular slaves were issued a linen gown like once a year, but he was spending thousands of dollars, the equivalent of thousands of dollars on, on clothes for her. Um, and then there are all these other details that you find from the farm book, which you can ascertain, yeah, there was an interest, there was a relationship there. Uh, the fact that she was his half uh, his wife's half sister meant that it's possible that she might have looked like his wife and he had made the deathbed promise to his wife that he would never marry again and he didn't and yet he's a sexual being um, and then all these female historians have tracked how if you go back all her pregnancies Jefferson was always at Monticello when she conceived um, always uh, and so it's it's these these things that indicate that there was definitely a relationship. And later there was some DNA testing. And even then some of the descendants continued to deny that he had had a relationship with Sally Hemings. So no matter what kind of evidence mounts, they just don't want to acknowledge that he could have ever had a relationship with Sally. Uh, and then Aaron Burr had had a relationship with a woman of color. She's uh, from India and she had been a servant in Theodosia uh, Barto Prevost's home. And Aaron had started a relationship with, with Theodosia while she was still married. And then ultimately her husband died and he married her. And Mary Emmons was part of the household and he started a relationship with, with her. Um, and I wrote about this in this piece called uh, For Princeton and Slavery. Um, uh, about uh, his relationship. And <laughs> the president of the Aaron Burr Association got really upset with me for saying that Aaron, that given that the fact that both women conceived uh, and had children the same year, meant he was having sexual relations with both at the same time. And he thought, that's a terrible thing. We shouldn't be telling that. But I'm like, okay, that's a fact. You look at the births and you <laughs> backtrack and that tells the story, right? That's right. That's right. So I mean, that that's a yeah. It's a it's a complicated history, I think, with a, especially the colonial period. But then yes. when we move into kind of the ante, antebellum South, how do you think we got to such a like draconian system of slavery, and then ultimately this like white supremacist um, system of Jim Crow after right? I mean, you know. I think, you know, it's a bizarre thing. Um, and what seemed like a good law was passed in 1808. So that outlawed the slave trade. So no more blacks could be brought into the country from Africa. So it just cut down on kidnapping of Africans. Though, of course, it still continued, but it was they were brought in secret secret. Um, but what happened as a consequence of that law is that slaveholders um, began to see that the Blacks that they owned at that time, and particularly the women, were very valuable property because women could produce more slaves. And that led to um, this big transportation of slaves out of Virginia, out of Maryland, 
to settle the the western lands so and jefferson had purchased you know been behind the louisiana purchase which led to native americans being removed and then white settlers coming in looking to farm the land and then they needed slaves to help them farm the land so it was like these two like events of jefferson's pregnancy pregnancy presidency <laughs> his presidency, which would seem like, you know, people have applauded him for the Louisiana Purchase because it more than doubled the size of the United States at a cost of less than three cents an acre um, was a good thing, but it led to this horrible removal of Indians. And if you've never read Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee, that book is just, it's just, drop, you know, tear dropping. I read that in high school and I was just fascinated and I was crying, you know, what happened. Um, so that led to the removal of Indians and then the importation of slaves from the, from the, um, the East Coast to farm the land. And then slaves became even more valuable and the number of slaves in the country increased where there was, there could have been a de decrease. The practice should have ended after the Revolutionary War. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, and then of course, there was that long civil war battle. And as we know, the longer a war is, the more hurt feelings, the more, and you know, people, you know, it's just a terrible thing that happened. Um, I wish Lincoln had lived instead of been assassinated. I think he would have been a person who could have appropriately brokered the peace. Um, there was reconstruction for a while. Uh, Grant was really good at, you know, sending in troops to enforce the rights of, of the newly freed slaves. Um, but then after he was gone, you get that rather behaze in the compromise that ends reconstruction. And then you get the rise of the Klan. Um, you get the rise of Jim Crow laws. And then you just get horrible. I mean, it's just horrible what happened after Reconstruction. And then every time there's a regression, and that was, there's, um, it takes long, a long time to get out of it. Um, and that was one thing that was fascinating to me is that um, free Blacks were voting, Indians were voting in early colonial Virginia. And in 1723, they were totally stripped of their right to vote, which of course implied that they had the right to vote. Um, and so, and then look how long it took to get that back. You know, black men got it back in the 15th amendment. And then there was the, um, uh, 100 years ago, 101 years ago now, uh, giving the right to women to vote. And then it took the civil rights movement to really enfranchise blacks. So it's that kind of thing we have these, elements of progression and then we have retraction and then it takes a long time to recover from retraction yeah and i yeah and it's it's amazing and i think we're in one of those moments of retraction and expansion at the same time you know we seem to be making headway but then we're also like the rise of the white supremacist movements in america have been you know surprising to some but anyone who's kind of been paying attention is like oh well this makes sense yeah yeah i think a lot of people were shocked by january 6th you know the armed insurrection the attempt to take over the capital stop the vote count um you know enshrine a president who has embraced white supremacy in many ways from his tweets um, from the comments on Charlottesville after you had that Nazi riot, you know, they're good people on both sides, you know, retreating, retweeting, you know, you know, the guy who rode by said white power, you know, it's, um, and so they were trying to enshrine him in as our permanent president. So that's an attempt at retrenchment, definitely. Um, and then fortunately that didn't happen because we get Biden who is um, inaugurated. He has um, appointed an attorney general who hopefully will be confirmed soon, who wants to look at what happened because I think there's more to come out, uh, much more to come out about that, that attempted insurrection on January 6th. Yeah, and I, I think um, 
I would just like to kind of circle back to something that you said, and I think it's incredibly important for the kind of your research, which is like the, the presence of free blacks really makes slavery even worse. Yes. You know, yes. I think, you know, yes. I read somewhere that, you know, the, the founding fathers had no problem expelling the monarchy. Right. They, they did, they had a, quite a bit of problem expelling slavery. Yeah, you know, and it's the reason why is too much wealth was tied up in it uh, by that time. You know, you had people like Jefferson, you know, Monticello could not have been built without slaves. I mean, he couldn't have hired enough free white labor to carry those bricks up that mountaintop to build that house. There was no way he could have built that without enforced uh, labor. And a lot of wealth was tied up in in slaves. Um, uh, and in fact, you know, in terms of um, the values of property for most people in that period of time, it was the land and um, and um, attachments to land like homes. And and then their slaves uh, were the second most valuable part of their their property. So that was the other problem. They know it's wrong but they can't quite get themselves out of it, you know, letting go of their property. And in that sense, I, you know, Washington for me um, is uh, an important person in this conversation because even though he did not free all his slaves during his lifetime, as he was dying, he wrote a will um, in which he, would free all his slaves upon the death of his wife, Martha. Um, and he had, I mean, he struggled with this because some of his slaves had married in with Martha's dower slaves and had children. So while he could free his slaves, he couldn't free Martha's slaves because they were meant to go to Martha's children by her first husband. Um, so he, he wrote this, provision in as well. And Martha thought that he had incentivized uh, his slaves to do her in to get their freedom early. So she wrote a deed giving them emancipation within a year of his death. So I have to admire him for, you know, he thought it through, he agonized about it. And then in the end, he freed everyone. And he's the only one of the slaveholding presidents to do that, despite all their pontification about how slavery was such a bad thing. I mean, Jefferson, to his credit, freed all of Sally's children, uh, freed uh, some of her other relatives. Sally was given her time. So essentially, she was free. She went to live with her freed sons. Um, but yeah, I mean, let's, I want to give, I mean, we're in a kind of this reevaluation of these people who are slaveholders, but I really want to give a shout out to Washington for at least doing that. I really appreciate that he did that. Yeah, and that's great. And, and, um, you know, I, it, it was a great book and I think I'm, uh, we're going to, I'm going to recommend it to everyone in my group. <laughs> That's what I know, and I think uh, you you did a good job, and I hope you uh, you can continue writing on this. I imagine. Yes, yes. I I that took six years to write. I don't know how long the next one's going to take, especially yeah. since I've lost a year of being able to go to archives, which are one of my favorite places to research. Uh, because the problem with computer searches, you've got to know kind of what the terms you are searching. But if you can go to an area in a library or you can ask for a particular box of, in an archives, you get to go and you get to see things that you might miss if you were just searching on a computer. And not everything has been, has been digitized. So there's still uh, a need to spend time in archives. So I can't wait to COVID has resolved itself and those of us who like researching can get back on the road again. Well, and, and I of course have to give a shout out to genealogical librarians who are just amazing at their job. Yes, so, they <laughs> are very helpful. So Good for, yes. Well, um, again, I want to thank you. And uh, this has been an amazing uh, talk. And I think uh, my group will get a lot out of it. So uh, all right. My pleasure. So